Come on, give God some more praise in this house. Hallelujah. Truly, you are the center of our lives. Amen. He's already covered the prayer for us, so let's just grab our Bibles. And repeat after me. This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. Today I will be taught. The word, of God. the word of God. I am, I am. Deliverance, deliverance Temple, deliverance. where we love, love. By, living by living our vision every day. We connect with our Creator continually. We, with our creator continually. we confess our deliverance consistently. We, our deliverance consistently. We, commit to serve we commit to serve creatively. We communicate Christ's love compassionately. Christ's love compassionately. Pastor, Andre, Pastor Andre, preach this word. Father God, be the center of my life. Amen. Come on, put your hands together one more time. Glory to the Lamb God. We're going to start off this morning with 2 Corinthians 14, 2, 14a. Mother Mitchell, would you read that? Now, thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph. In Christ. Thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph. The script, the song that was just sung, lets us know, they call it the anthem, lets us know that he, he has won the victory. And because he's won the victory, you are victorious. And the Bible says that he always causes us to triumph. I don't think it meant words. It says he always causes us to triumph 
in Christ. And so tonight, the title of today's sermon is simply this, It's My Winning Season. Why don't you shout that with me and say, It's My Winning Season. Say it again, it's my winning season. One more time, it's my winning season. Now, I've, I've got to set it up the way I want to because when it's a winning season, sometimes we think that means ease. And it is my winning season, but I've been in battles. It is my winning season, but I've gotten tired. It is my winning season, but I've taken some shots, some sucker punches. So when you declare it's my winning season, we're not declaring that everything will be easy, but we're saying in the end, we win. And so as I go through the message, every time you hear me say it's my winning season, I want you to repeat it and say the same thing. So let's practice it before we get rolling. It's my winning season. It's my winning season. It's my winning season. All right, we're ready to preach the word of God. Let's go to 2 Corinthians 8 and 13, and Mother Mitchell, read it from there. In the 14th year of King Hezekiah's reign, Sennacherib. Sennacherib, king of Assyria, attacked all the fortified cities of Judah and captured them. Just to paint the picture, Sennacherib was a king from Assyria, and he was running through all the countries and all the kingdoms, and he finally pointed himself toward Judah. And Jerusalem is the capital city of Judah, but he got all the surrounding cities and he was headed for Judah. But it just so happened that at this time in Judah's life, there was a king that was a king of God. It was the king Hezekiah. Let's go to verse 14. So Hezekiah, king of Judah, sent this message to the king of Assyria at Lachish. I have done wrong. Withdraw from me, and I will pay whatever you demand of me. The king of Assyria exacted from Hezekiah, king of Judah, 300 talents of silver and 30 talents of gold. One of the things that this king would do, the king of Syria, uh, of Syria, Assyria, called Sennacherib, he would make sure everybody paid tribute to him. He exacted a tax. He wanted their money. And so Hezekiah was like, I'm sorry, let, let, me, let me give up the funds because you're right at my doorstep. Let's look at verse 15. So Hezekiah gave him all the silver that was found in the temple of the Lord and in the treasures, treasuries of the royal palace. He was a king of God, but he knew he was in dire straits. And so he gave all the silver that was in the temple. He gave everything that he could give in the next verse, verse 16. At this time, Hezekiah, king of Judah, stripped off the gold with which he had covered the doors and doorposts of the temple of the Lord and gave it to the king of Assyria. It was so bad and things were so rough, he started taking the doorknobs off. He started taking the hinges that had gold on them and was giving everything he could give to preserve his life. Number one, point number one. We've got ten points and we're going to run through them. Number one, the enemy is never satisfied. Even though Hezekiah gave all that he could give, even though he said he was sorry, when you have an enemy, when you have a sadistic enemy, and the devil is a sadistic enemy, no matter what you give, it's not enough. Somebody says sin will take you longer than you want to stay take you further than you want to go. No matter what you try to do to appease the enemy, it's never enough. And even though Hezekiah done that, Sennacherib would not return his army. He kept on coming. Let's go to the next verse, verse 17. The king of Assyria sent his supreme commander, his chief officer, and his field commander with a large army from Lachish to King Hezekiah at Jerusalem. They came up to Jerusalem and stopped at the aqueduct of the upper pool on the road of the washerman's field. If you, to give us some background, you have to understand that, first of all, when Hezekiah knew what was going on and he knew that this king was doing that, he started rebuilding Jerusalem. And what he did is he made a wall around Jerusalem and then he made an outer wall around the Jerusalem to keep them protected. And then they came up with a scheme that we're going to stop the outer water that
that's coming into the city and we're going to bring it all inside. We're going to keep everything inside and we're going to dig our heels in and hope this storm passes over us. And there's nothing wrong with that. But sometimes in your life, you don't, the storm won't pass over you. You got to confront the storm. And so even though they did this, and then his next result was, okay, give him all the money. They did this. The king kept coming. And then not only did he come, he came and he broke through that outer wall, and he was right next to the wall of Jerusalem. He was so close that they could hear what he was saying. Let me give you a little background and put this up. It says 45,000 princes riding in. Golden and silver chariots led the way, followed by 80,000 knights in armor and 60,000 swordsmen. So here's Hezekiah and the people of Judah. They, the, this army has already broken in, and not only did they break in, there's 185,000 of them surrounding the city. What is we going to do? But it's my winning season. So you already forgot. Every time I say it's my winning season, y'all got to say it's my winning season. So we're going to act like that didn't happen. We're going to do it again. There was 185,000 people surrounding them, but it's my winning season. You might be in $185,000 worth of debt, but it's still your winning season. You might be facing divorce, but it's my winning season. I'm not talking about when things just turn around. You went to the altar and the next day everything fixed. I'm talking about when you're facing the devil and you're staring the devil in his face and everything looks bad and everything looks rough. Down on the inside, you still got to declare, it's my winning season. All right, thank God for y'all working with me. Verse 19. The field commander said to them, tell Hezekiah, this is what the great king, the king of Assyria said, oh, what are you basing this confidence of yours? Why are you so confident? Let me give you an example. The, what, what they did is they, they stacked up pillows to get up and see over into Jerusalem. They didn't breach the wall yet because they couldn't bring all 185,000 over the wall. So they got up on the wall and began to talk to the people in the city and said, tell Hezekiah, why are you so confident? Sometimes the devil gets as close as he can to you to talk to you. Sometimes it's not until you lay your head to sleep after the day and the devil starts talking to your mind, telling you what you are not going to do and why do you have faith and you should quit. And I know you're saying he's the sin of your life and that he's won the victory, but you're going to die in your sins. Cancer's going to take over. Your, your child's not going to get saved. You're not going to break the addiction. The devil has a way of getting right up next to you and talking to you and talking in your face. And, and I know you praise God and I know you've been to church, but when you're all by yourself, sometimes it gets a little rough. Because the devil gets real close to you. Ah, sometimes the devil gets close to the people that's close to you. And just like Job, sometimes your spouse will say, curse God and die. You don't know how the devil's going to come. But when you've got something down on the inside, and like Brother Chick said, when you have an expected end, the devil's coming to challenge your faith. But it's my winning season. Ah, I feel something in this Holy Ghost church this morning. Verse 20, would you read it? You say you have the counsel and the might for war, but you speak only empty words. On whom are you depending that you rebel against me? King told me to tell you your words is empty. Why do you think you can rebel against me? But remember, Hezekiah gave everything he could give, but the enemy is still coming. Tell him his words is empty. I know you said you above only and not beneath, but those are empty words. I know you confess the word of God, but you ain't got nothing because every now and then you still look at pornography and you still have a margarita on the side. So you ain't nobody and God's not going to deliver you and God's not going to make a way for you. I don't know if I'm talking to anybody that's had the battle in the mind. The biggest war you'll ever face is between these two ears when the devil tries to talk to your mind. Verse 22, read that. But if you say to me, we are depending on the Lord our God, isn't he the one whose high places and altars Hezekiah removed? 
saying to Judah and Jerusalem, you must worship before this altar in Jerusalem. This is something interesting that's brought up. If you look at the kings of Israel and the kings of Judah, every single one of the kings of Israel were evil. There was about eight of the kings of Judah that were good. Hezekiah was the best of them because he was the only king to pull down the high places. What that means is that Israel had got to a place where they were serving other gods and they had created altars for other gods. And when the good kings would come, they would change and say, we need to worship God, but they wouldn't pull down the high places. But Hezekiah pulled down all the altars and said, we're going to worship God alone. And so what this person is saying, he's saying, you should have started serving them other gods because all you got is one God. Them other countries we came against, they had 15 and 20 gods. But Hezekiah then made you only believe in one God so you should really know we're going to tear you up. Yeah. Next verse, verse 25. But if you say to me, we are depending on the Lord our God, isn't he the one who's high places we want, to, we, want to go to 20, we want to go to 25, the next verse. Furthermore, have I come to attack and destroy this place without word from the Lord? The Lord himself told me to march against this country and destroy it. Here's a crazy thing. If the devil can't intimidate, intimidate you right off the bat, the next thing he'll tell you is the attack that you're under is from the Lord. Have you ever had the devil tell you, you know you did? See, here's the problem. The Bible calls him the accuser of the brethren. So he knows what we've done. When we're in the church, we do everything right in the building most of the time. But when we get away from the building, that's when we struggle with our flesh. And we don't always win the struggle with our flesh. And so if you cussed when you shouldn't have cussed, if you've done something that you shouldn't have done, but you're still trying to believe the Lord, whenever you come under attack, the first thing the devil says is God, God getting you. He getting you because you know you're no good. But here's the thing. You, you've never been any good. It's not about your goodness. It's about the righteousness of God. But everything that comes against you, if you're really good and saved, the devil will tell you it's your fault. You didn't read enough scriptures. You didn't pray enough. You didn't give enough. You sang the wrong song. You should have said hallelujah, but you said thank you, Jesus. Everything you do, the devil will tell you it's your fault you're not blessed. It's your fault your marriage is struggling. It's your fault. Of everything is your fault. And he says it's the Lord. Number two, the enemy tries to convince you this is what God wants. One of the hardest things to get Christians to understand is sometimes it's just demonic attack. It's not that God is mad at you. It's not that God doesn't love you, but he's allowing the attack to build character in you. So sometimes you got to go through the attack, but i got to let you know we believe in the grace of Jesus Christ, the cross of Jesus Christ. There's nothing that the grace of Jesus Christ cannot fix. Sometimes you do have to tell them you're sorry. Sometimes you do have to repent and change your ways. But stop believing that God has given up on you. He's turned his back on you. He's got a lightning bolt to hit you. That is the work of the devil. The mess that's going on in your life is the work of the devil. This is not God. This is the devil. Now, let me pause and say sometimes we blame everything on the devil that we shouldn't be blaming on the devil. I don't have time to talk about that, but I'm talking about when you're under demonic attack, but it's a demonic attack that the devil tells you is what God wants. I don't know if anybody been there, but I've been there. I've been there when I've been praising God and no matter what I did, it was never good enough. And, be, and sometimes God's not talking because the teacher don't talk during the test. So when God's not talking, you just left with your mind, your scriptures, and the devil trying to convince you it's your fault. Everything that goes wrong is your fault. You didn't do good enough. And you can always find something wrong with yourself. If you really truly save, you know you're not perfect. You know you're not all the way right. You know you wake up sometimes on the wrong side of the bed. You know you cuss like a sailor when ain't nobody watching. You know you watch stuff you ain't got no business watching. You try to do better. You love the Lord. But all that stuff comes back up the moment you're under attack. Remember when you did this? The devil will bring up stuff from 25 years ago. You'll find yourself repenting from stuff from 25 years ago. It's already buried under the blood, but he's the accuser of the brethren. The Bible says he accuses day and night. No matter what it is, he tries to convince you God is not pleased with you. God's not going to bring 
bring you out. God's not going to bless you. The reason why your kids are messed up because you were a bad parent, maybe you were a bad parent, but his grace and his mercy is there, and the devil's trying to convince you it's your fault. Because he's a, he's a dastardly devil. I almost said something. He's an evil devil. He, he, you you got to watch out. He's something. He's, he's a rough character. Number three. The enemy, well, no, actually, let's, let's go back. Let's go back to 1826. Then Elkin said to the field commander, please speak to your servants in Aramaic, since we understand it. Don't speak to us in Hebrew in the hearing of the people on the wall. They, uh, they appealed to him and said, how about you just talk to us in Aramaic? Because they spoke Aramaic. And said, just talk to us so we can understand it, and then we can tell it to the people. What they were trying to do is protect the people from hearing all this noise. So number three, the enemy wants to intimidate with words. What we've already explained. Let's look at verse 27. Read that. But the commander replied, was it only to your master and you that my master sent me to say these things? And not to the people sitting on the wall who, like you, will have to eat their own excrement and drink their own urine. He was talking rough, talking bad to him. He said, no, I'm not going to speak in Aramaic. I'm going to speak in Hebrew. I want all them to hear me. I want them to know they're going to eat their own dung and drink their own urine. He always tried to intimidate you with words. Have you ever worried all night over something that has yet to happen? But in your mind, it's already happened. I've already lost a job. I've, I've already got arrested. I've already, I've, I got felonies, and so I'm putting in job applications. But in your mind, they're not going to hire a felon because the devil always tries to intimidate you with words. That's why the Bible says we got to renew our mind. You've got to have something else going in your head. I don't mind you listening to Cardi B, but you cannot have all that going on in your head when you're under a heavy attack. You gotta have some word. You gotta have some scriptures. You gotta have a praise down on the inside because you're not gonna make it because he does not always attack on Sunday morning. He doesn't always attack when you're around other Christians and when the tambourine is going and the organ is playing and the drum is beating. He waits till you're by yourself. I'm reminded of the snipers in Washington, D.C. years ago. And what they did, they waited till people were isolated and they began to pick them off. And the devil is like a mad sniper. And he waits till you get isolated. He waits till you get depressed. He waits. And Christians do get depressed. Don't let somebody preach to you that you can just pray through depression. Sometimes Christians get depressed and the devil's trying to snipe you and pick you off and talk bad to you. But it's my winning season. Yeah. 1828, read that. Then the commander stood and called out in Hebrew, hear the word of the great king, the king of Assyria. He called out in Hebrew. He wouldn't even, he wouldn't even try to help. Number four. Supposed to stir up fear in everyone around you. You might have faith, but he'll stir up fear in everybody around you. If you take your kids, we you know, we, we, we believe in God for this. You take his house, we believe in God for this. You make everybody scared. You make everybody nervous. You can make folks in church nervous. I remember when I was talking about how I believe that God was going to make me a father. And even though we had had miscarriage, I believe that God was going to make me a father. Somebody pulled his eyes and said, You might need to think about adopting. I know I need, I might need to think about adopting, but I'm talking about I believe God's going to open the room. But when I listen to even church people, they try to talk me out of my faith because if the enemy can't get to you, he stirs up fear and everybody around you. Go to somebody and say, I got a business I can be, and they take all the reasons why you can't be there. Because it stirs up fear, and sometimes you got to do this by yourself. <laughs> 18 and 29, read that. This is what the king said Do not let Hezekiah deceive you. He cannot deliver you from my hand. Verse 30. Do not let Hezekiah persuade you to trust in the Lord when he said, The Lord will surely deliver us. This city will not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. When you walk out of the door, don't let that fear convince you. Don't let that bald headed, bearded, sweating man convince you God is not going to bring you out. I know he was hooping and hollering, but he's not going to do it for you. He might do it for the person in the seat next to you because he's a better Christian than you, but he's not going to do it for you. And so he takes the word of your leader and twists it on his head, and you are happy in church, but when you leave, it's not going to. Don't let him convince you that God is on your 
so I know that can convince you that it's your wedding season. Oh, I can convince you that God will bring you out. Don't let him convince you because he don't know how dirty you are. He don't know how messed up you are. You got to fight the attack of the enemy. Verse 31 and 32. We put these two together for you. Do not listen to him as This is what the king of Assyria said. Make peace, choose life, and not death. Do not listen to him as for he is misleading you when he said, The Lord will deliver us. Pastor is misleading you. Bishop Jason is misleading you. Every time you get done fighting that, you go on Facebook and find somebody talking about how all the pastors are lying to me. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.
Verse 6. The enemy wants you to lose faith in God. That's why I told you sometimes you need to lose faith. They're you to put your faith in God. But he'll test your faith in God. Paul ain't like Peter. Peter stepped out on the water and everything was good. It took his mind to sink. I didn't step out in faith and believe God and took his mind going back. But he wants you to lose your faith in God. Whatever you do, don't lose. Somebody tell, tell that to somebody. Whatever you do, don't lose faith in God. Sometimes you got to call in reinforcements. 
Sometimes all the reinforcements don't go to your church. Your church is not the only people going to heaven. Your denomination is not the only people going to heaven. Sometimes you got to reach to somebody else. It may even be the Pope. You may, the Pope might be saying something that gets your delivery. You got to find a way to call in some reinforcements. If you can't find anybody, talk to the angels. Angels, I command you to come and move and minister for me. I can't take another day. I can't cry myself to sleep another night. I need your help. Mercy come. Peace come, love come, whatever you got to do, call in some reinforcements, call in the cavalry, call in the spiritual air force, call in reinforcements, don't try to handle this by yourself, that's why it's important when somebody calls you, you don't have a bunch of doubt and foolishness in your mind, you need to, when somebody calls you, they ought to be getting the word of God off of your lips, I'll never forget something that happened years ago, when I had somebody call me and I wasn't even in the state of praying, but they called me and they needed prayer. I opened my mouth and the prayer of God came through me, prayed everything that they needed because they called at the right moment. See, here's the thing. We're just a vessel. So always be ready because God will use and flow through you to bless somebody else. You might be somebody's deliverance for tomorrow. All right, uh, 19 and 3. They told him, this is what Hezekiah says. This day is a day of distress and rebuke and disgrace. As when children come to the moment of birth, and there is no strength to deliver this. This gives you the context of that scripture that Bishop preaches all the time. It's the scripture he heard when Jonathan was about to die in the womb. The devil was trying to bring this scripture, but it didn't have its full context. Let's read the next verse. It may be that the Lord your God will hear all the words of the field commander, whom his master, the king of Assyria, has sent to ridicule the living God, and that he will rebuke him for the words the Lord your God has heard. Therefore, pray for the remnant they, that still survive. Point number eight. The enemy forgets that his words against you are really words against your God. See, he was speaking on behalf of Sennacherib and talking to the Hebrew people and telling them how this, that, and the other. But he kept saying, God's not going. And God's not going. And what he forgot, he wasn't really talking to the Hebrews no more. He was talking to their God. The devil that's attacking you, he makes, this is why I tell people, he always overplays his hand. He always goes one step beyond what he should go. He always does a little too much and then he steps over into the territory of your God. He's trying to attack Chip, but he steps over and gets into Chip's God. He's trying to destroy Joyce, but he makes a mistake and step over into Joyce's God. He always forgets why he's trying to attack you. He always forgets there's somebody that's got your back. Next verse, verse 6. Isaiah said to them, tell your master, this is what the Lord says. Do not be afraid of what you have heard. Those words with which the underlings of the king of Assyria have blasphemed me. He said, don't forget. Now, number nine, the enemy forgets the power of your words in prayer to God. We're going to turn to see something that not only did Hezekiah come to the house of God and get a word from the man of God, Isaiah, and call in reinforcements. He went and talked straight to God himself. Let's read these prayers, this part of this prayer, 2 Kings 19 15. And Hezekiah prayed to the Lord. Lord, the God of Israel, enthroned between the cherubim. Hold on, stop right there. Don't, don't be ashamed to talk about where God is. I, I know we can come and we can talk to God regular. He hears your English. But every now and then, talk about God, the majestic God. I'm not saying you pray like that to impress people. I'm talking about by yourself. Call him every name in the book you can find. The majestic God, the special God, the loving God. Oh, kind Father, oh, gracious God, pull up everything you know because God loves to be praised. The Bible says he inhabits the praises of his people. And when you start praying before you ask for anything, start thanking him for what he already is and what he's already done. God, I got something to ask you, but I thank you that I got breath in my body. I thank you that I got the activity of my limbs. I thank you that I'm in my right mind. I thank you for what you've done in my life. God, I got something going on on my job. But before I talk about my job, God, I thank you that I have a job. I thank you I got to learn how to praise God. And so Hezekiah began to go for folk and begin to pray to God. Read some more. Lord, the God of Israel, enthroned between the cherubim, you alone are the God over all the kingdoms of the earth. 
You have made heaven and earth. Whew, let's, let's go to the next one. Give ear, Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, Lord, and see. Sometimes we get mad at God because we know he hears and he already sees. But it doesn't hurt to tell him, look at my situation, God. God, I know you know what's going on, but hear my cry, oh God. Don't be afraid to talk to him like that. Read some more. Listen to the words Sennacherib has sent to ridicule the living God. The devil is on my case, but really he's coming after you. He's telling me I'm not going to make it, but really he's coming after the call you have on my life. It's really not about me, God. It's about you, God. And so he's really bothering you. So God, do something not for me, but for your name's sake. Next verse, 17. It is true, Lord, that the Assyrian kings have laid waste these nations and their lands. Sometimes what the devil says is true. He has done this. Yeah, nobody has bounced back after the fall that I've had. Yeah, it is true, but it don't have to be true for me because it's my winning season. It's my winning season. Next verse. Now, Lord our God, deliver us from his hand so that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you alone, Lord, are God. I understand what this is about, God. Don't deliver me. So I can have a Bentley, and I can have a mansion, and I can tell people that I'm so good and my ties brought this. No, I understand what this is about. Deliver me so that the people will know that you are God. Because nobody could have got me out of this but God. I want you to do it so your name is praised. I want you to do it so people look at me and shake their head and say, this is the Lord's doing. And it's marvelous. God, you get the glory. God, you get the praise. I'll take whatever blessing you give me, but it's about you getting the glory. Sometimes you go through what you go through because people are watching you. And they need to know there is a God. They've seen you get beyond the Christian cliches. How you doing? I'm blessed and highly favored. That works for the first six months. But when you've been in it six years, I'm struggling. Pray for me. When you get in it a little longer, like you don't even say a word, just. <laughs> Service is over, I can't even hug nobody, I just got to tip out. <laughs> oh, but when God delivers you, and you come down dancing around the aisles, and running around the church, somebody going to know what happened to them, and they going to find out God broke through, and people going to give God the glory, because it looks like it couldn't happen, but it's my winning season. We got another number nine. Number nine, part B says this. The enemy forgets God has the final word. 1932 says what? Therefore, this is what the Lord says concerning the king of Assyria. He will not enter this city or shoot an arrow here. He will not come before it with shield or build a siege ramp against it. Wait a second. I told you they had stacked up these pillows to get right up on the wall. And he says he's not even going to shoot an arrow over the wall. He could have spit over the wall and hit somebody. But God said, you're not even going to get to shoot an arrow. You've been doing all this talking. It reminds me of the movies when you, you have this, the villain and the hero. And the villain finally gets a chance to get to the hero. And he pulls out his gun. And before he pulls out his gun, he goes to this long speech. When he goes to this long speech and you're watching the movie, you know somehow the hero won't make it out. And that's what the devil does. He's so dumb, he gets close enough to take you out, then he starts running his big, fat, ugly mind. Let's read some more. Verse 33. By the way that he came, he will return. He will not enter this city, declares the Lord. He's, I know he's close. I know you can feel his fire on your breath. I know it look, I know you have the divorce papers in your hand, but God says he's not even going to enter into the city. Verse 34. I will defend this city Ooh. and save it for my sake and for the sake of David, my servant. And he said, and Hezekiah, it's not even about you. It's about my name and your ancestors. I like how Brother Chip brought up the founder of this church. The founder of this church was Bishop Jimmy Clark, who passed away just a, a year or so ago. And we talked about it. We talked about it in Bible study how the vision he had in this church that men would be coming off the street, lifting their hands up because they've been delivered. When people hear your 
testimony. It's going to bring them into the house of God. They're going to stick their hands up and be delivered. And it's not going to have anything to do with you. But God's going to honor the word he showed Bishop Clark years ago. Because he said, I've got to honor your ancestors. There's prayers that's been like, you cannot lose. You cannot fail. There's been too many prayers down through the years coming to this point. And it is your winning season. Verse 35. That night the angel of the Lord went out and put to death 185,000 in the Assyrian camp. When the people got up the next morning, there were all the dead bodies. Normally when you read in biblical battles, he has the Israel army go out and fight. Something happens, but in the nighttime, the angel of the Lord, see, because he had got on God's good nerves. He, it was no longer about Hezekiah and the Hebrews. It was about God preserving his word. And the angel of the Lord came down, and all 185,000 got killed. Sennacherib didn't die because God wanted him to see it. When he woke up, every one of the army that he was boasting about, was bragging about, they was all laying dead. I don't know what demons is coming after you, but they're going to die in their sleep. They're going to die before they get to you because it's my winning season. All the power of God, the spirit of the living God is going to fall fresh in your life and turn things around because it's my winning season. Last one and this is where we're closing from. Number 10 the enemy forgets the power of Passover and the relevance of communion. This is where we're pausing and stop right here. During this season that Hezekiah and them were under attack it was Passover season. And they weren't able to celebrate like they could have celebrated because they were under heavy attack. But they were celebrating Passover. And when you look at the angel of the Lord, let's go back to that verse, previous verse, 1935. That, that night, the angel of the Lord, when you see the angel of the Lord, two times you see him in Genesis specifically. Number one is when he came against Sodom and Gomorrah. And he came to Abraham's house. And they said, I can't do this without telling my friend. And then the angel of God went to Sodom and Gomorrah, and we know what happened. It rained down destruction. The second time we see the angel of the Lord, it was spoken when the children of Israel were in Goshen. And the very last plague, the ninth plague had come, but the last plague was the killing of all the firstborn. And they said, one thing you've got to do, if you're going to make it out, because when this angel comes, it will take out anything. But just take some blood and put it over the doorpost. And he said, when I see the blood, I'll pass over you. It was that same angel that stepped down and knocked 185,000. And this is what I got to get you to understand. It is the blood of God over your life that will make God fight for you, but fight so strong and you don't get none of the blowback. Fight so strong and you don't get touched by it. But you got to have the blood of the Lord. So we thank God for Passover. But what we're going to do, we're going to take communion right now. And what the communion does for us today, it commissions. It's my winning season.